How's it going, everybody? Welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. And today I have the chance to talk to Yuan Sundhag, which I think I said that right, right? <laughs> Pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Great. Yuan is a developer for Clevgrind, who is making awesome audio plugins for your DAW, but also for your iOS um, apps, you know, your devices. Um, so I'm very excited to talk because I've, I've uh, really enjoyed this approach you guys have towards the design and the sound and everything. So you're doing a lot of things that are exciting in my type of world and my, my style. So you want, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure and I'm honored to be here. Oh, well, uh, <laughs> honored to have you because as I said, um, I, I love your work. I've got a good collection of, uh, your software in my own my own little library and uh for this podcast actually i very often turn to bruce bruce fry mm -hmm. which is the noise reduction um oh oh yeah yeah, yeah. and that one um you know that's great if there's like little background noises or i'm, I'm breathing too loud in the microphone <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah big fan thank you well, it's interesting, uh, Bruce, uh, free, we call it in Sweden. It means noise free. So yeah. uh, we have uh, strange names on our plugins. Uh, it's probably one of our most appreciated apps, right? The plugins right now. Oh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, a lot of people are making noisy recordings then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's so easy to use because... Mm -hmm compared to other similar noise reduction plugins, it's uh, a bit more work to remove the noise and keep the other audio content. Right. Actually, yeah. That's always the big issue if you're gonna start like, maybe you're EQing out noise and hum or whatever yeah. approach you take. It's always at the expense of the sound you're trying to preserve. Yeah, exactly. But I think um, the way you guys developed, um, the app, the app Bruce Free. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, the way you guys developed it, it, it's such a simple interface. There's an ear you press that listens to the sound, right? And yeah. you just put that over the, the part, the portions of silence, if you have any, where that noise is going. And it's, it seems to kind of intelligently just pull it out of there for you. And you also have some controls over how much and how deep you want it to go. Yeah. It's uh, it's built up on a whole lot of a whole lot of gates that's working internally, mm -hmm. and uh, that works on different frequency spectrums, sort of areas of frequencies, and uh, because of psychoacoustics, when you do a lot of gating on a lot of different frequency regions, it sounds like you're not removing the act just the, it sounds like you just remove the noise mm -hmm. wow, so, so oh, that's how it works it's actually really simple hmm. so it's almost like a like a multi-band gate that it picks up the frequencies that it needs to grab. yeah exactly wow. uh, that's very clever uh, because because i've tried to do things like that with gates um, but you know, as soon as, if it's for the podcast, for instance, as soon as you yeah. start speaking, well, that noise just pops right back out and, um, you know, it's great for when you're not speaking, but as soon as you talk, then all the, all the hums. And exactly. But, but when you use uh, enough gates and you have to tune them, that was when you press the ear, you tune the gates, thresholds, and, uh, actually some ratios as well, I think, hmm. um, they are, most, they are perfectly tuned. It will work if you use a lot of them right. <laughs> with a very narrow frequency or areas. So, yeah. so I guess you're not really, in that way, you're not cutting out too much of the source materials frequency that you want to keep. Nah, exactly. Yeah. But you cut it when there is other material that, when that other material sounds, you think you are hearing the sounds that are cut, actually. Uh-huh. I gotcha. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's a bit hard to explain, but it just works. 
Yeah. And that is what I love about it is it just works. <laughs> you just hit that ear, you wait a couple seconds and, and next thing you know, it, everything's cleaned up. And most of the time I, I don't even have to go into the, 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 and there's only a few controls anyway, but I don't really usually have to go into that. I don't have to do no, that. No, no, it's for maybe some, in some circumstances you have to fine tune a little bit, but actually, honestly, uh, we tried this with a four band first, you know, in logic with gates and uh, multiband split and such mm -hmm. and thought, yeah, this might be cool. And then we coded it and uh, we do, did the learn thing. Yeah. <laughs> and actually the first time we tried it, we went, what? It <laughs> works a lot more better than we thought it would. Oh, isn't it nice when that works out? <laughs> then we tweaked a lot. Uh, we spent a couple of months tweaking it. So the algorithm is like it was when we re released it. But um, we were a, a little bit surprised ourselves when <laughs> we yeah. first ran it, actually. Yeah, I mean, for me too, because that's always something um, I've always been a little skeptical of. Um, any, any time, and I heard this analogy, I thought it was just a great way of explaining it, like audio is sort of like a cake. You know, once you put the eggs and the milk and the flour together, you can't bake the cake and then take your eggs back out. Ah, uh, yeah, like exactly. Found where you can't just pull the noise out without sacrificing something else. But, mm. and that was kind of you know why as soon as I heard it, I was like, okay, I'm I'm gonna have to buy this one because this is great. <laughs> it just it it took the eggs out of my mix, you know, separated <laughs> my flour out, it up in, in a really surprising way. Yeah, but uh, that's also uh, other uh, plugins that is a bit magic. Is uh, Melodyne is for me is a yeah. bit uh, magic. You can actually, I've been around since the nineties, and the first time I tried Melodyne, I went, "What? Yeah, it's well, so that's... cool that you can do that's really picking out the eggs." I think for me at least. Yeah, I, I mean, um, so that allows you to do like pitch correction polyphonically now uh, exactly and, and, um, i don't own melodyne but i've had some fun playing around with it friends and um it's amazing you can take a major key and, and turn it into a minor key song yeah. uh, exactly and uh, i know people colleagues at work using it in uh, when they have recording sessions and tune guitars afterwards yeah. <laughs> Yeah, right. Imagine <laughs> how much trouble that would have saved you. Like for me, <laughs> tuning guitars has always been like, <laughs> and yeah. Especially um, now, especially um, because I I started as a guitar player, playing okay. bands, and it was like tuning guitars. Obviously, is a big deal, and they all have to be relatively in tune with each other. But there's this kind of like you know approximation every instrument has there's yes no of course to find a 440 you're playing it's it's near it mm. and when you mix them all together it's like you're allowed to have that little wiggle room but when you're especially like inside the box and you've got your digital synth that's pumping out a 440 and nothing else uh, exactly if yeah anything differs your guitar is just having a hard time sitting with it <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, I think it's really hard to play, especially electric guitars with the the thin strings, strings. Yeah, with the fingers, it's impossible to play in tune, even if you tune it perfectly and everything. And then when you strike a chord, ah, sounds like shit <laughs> for me. <laughs> yeah, well, I agree. It's it's um, I and that's how I. St grew playing music there was always no matter how well you tuned like the intonation on one end of the guitar could be totally different on the higher yeah. frets exactly it, it's not like that on a, a digital synth at least no uh, that's true yeah. and, you know, I'm, a, I'm a bass player originally yeah, that's I not the same thing nice, either a, a nice bass hanging from the wall right there behind you uh, yeah oh yeah that's my what is oh it's uh it's a fender yes yes that's a normal the one i used to play mm, i always love those nice thin neck yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, nice. So that's got to be a cool feeling. Like when you develop something and then you try it out, and you're like, oh, that's even better than we thought. Yeah. <laughs> sure that's it doesn't fun. happen too many times. Yeah. <laughs> it's probably the only, the only time it, it, it happens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So um, what is your role exactly within Clevgrand? Um, your part, I know you're the developer. Um, where, what's your kind of day-to-day -day work look like? Oh, uh, I am a developer, which means I, well, I'm not only a developer, actually. I, I am responsible for the products as products in a way, because it's, we are, how many are we now? We are five working in only with Clevgrand, uh, the plugins and such. Mm -hmm. And my responsibilities is to, you know, do the programming. It's, that's me and uh, one guy more that's called Mikael. And, but we also, everyone do everything a little bit. So coming up with new plugin ideas is one of my, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, what do I, I really don't know what I'm doing when I'm thinking <laughs> of it. Uh, well, making sure developing plugins, coming up with UI and UX ideas. I don't do any graphics myself. It's mm -hmm. the other ones, but how the graphics should be and work for the user. Right. And well, designing components, it's hard to explain, but designing components, how the user should be able to interact with them. Mm -hmm. Like how a knob should be or a XY pad, or if it should be a slider and such and such, or if it's something special. Yeah. So I, I write the DSP code. I make sure the plugin works. And, you know, that's from ID to finished product, mm -hmm. except for the graphics. But then we are, the other, one, other people always have opinions and we collaborate a lot and try different ideas from, uh, well, on the way from a prototype or an early idea to the finished product. It's everyone is involved in everything, mm -hmm. more or less. Right, so that's, that's what makes it special, right? All the different hands in the mix. Oh, maybe, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. Yeah, well, I think one of the things that makes your work stand out is the look of it, you know, the, the design. Um, and I, I think to like, um, maybe like a good example might be like Press It, which is the multi-band compressor, yeah. uh, which multi-band compression, it's like, you know, that's, that's a heavy subject. And you're not only dealing with compression, which is difficult for a lot of people anyway, but yeah, then you yeah. get the different bands and why you would do it. And, and you guys have managed to put together this really like, first of all, pleasant to look at interface and um, easy to understand what's happening by the visual feedback you're getting. Yeah. Uh, we always think that's important to... It, it should be, uh, I, maybe, I, I don't know if I like the word educational for it, but it should be easy to understand how things work mm -hmm. by graphic design or user, ex, yeah, user experience. It should be easy to, it should feel logic. Yeah. When you yeah. want a sound to sound a certain way, it should be, you should get that without need to read the manual that's probably we are aiming for most of the time at least mm -hmm. so does this go through like lots of notebook sketches and um, passing around you know storyboarded ideas and things like yeah that? but uh, sometimes it just it's we just know what to do we have any we talk we have meetings every day every week at least and we have come, someone comes up with an idea and everything, we know exactly what to do from the start. We should do a uh, example. Do, have you seen the Korvpressor? The other 
compression unit. Yes. Just squeeze yeah. something. Beautiful design again. Yeah. Yeah. It was uh, Sebastian. Uh, he makes the most graphic stuff right now. And he, his idea was, what if you can squeeze the audio? <laughs> you pinch it. Yeah, good idea. And then from that, I, th I think everyone in the team knew how we wanted it to be. Then there was a lot of details going on in between, but that was a basic idea of the Colpresso. You should be able to squeeze the sound into yeah. a... It, it's a great way to explain it. I mean, that's kind of what you do when you compress. You're squeezing it down and then you're pulling it back up. And Exactly, yeah. The interface you have, it's almost like, um, almost like a pipe or something that the sound is going through and then the squeeze happens yeah. and then you stretch it back out. You yeah. Volume, your, that's really your output gain. And um, I, I think it's a brilliant way to just teach someone how a compressor works too. Exactly. We have uh, we had meals for different sound engineer teaching people, <laughs> teachers from different places that uses compressor for uh, new students that uh, this is how a compressor works. The first one lives on showing off that one. Then there's thresholds, ratios, times, attack and release, and knee and stuff. That's not covered in compressor. It's happening automatically in the background. Mm -hmm. But it shows a basic idea of compression at least. And uh, I don't think so many people get that and know about that even if they are working with music actually. Oh, I agree with that. Um, as one who teaches people how to use this stuff and as a person who spent <laughs> many years with a compressor, not really <laughs> understanding what I was doing, but throwing it on everything. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it God, it's louder. It sounds better. <laughs> was really what I was doing. I had a, a like kind of a revelation moment. I was working on a track for so long. I, I would wanted to get it perfect, you know, and more and more, I feel like that's not the best thing for me. To, I'm better off <laughs> just doing it fast. But I had all, I had compressors on like everything. And I was just like, let me just take the compressors off, see how it sounds. And the track just opened up. And I was like, yeah. I've been wasting so much of my life <laughs> throwing these on. And it really made me take some time then to go figure out what I'm actually doing with these things. And yeah, yeah. It's, it is really hard to work, uh, to know how to work with the compressor. It takes years, I think. Yeah. At least for me, it did. You can get the idea of what it does, but then working with it musically is it's a challenge, I think. At least for me. Oh, I, I, was, I've been using them for, I don't know, 15 years, 20 years almost. Mm. I mean, 20 years, I guess. And I'm still learning. I'm still figuring it out. And the more and more I use it, the more I realize I should use it less. Exactly. I got to be yeah. more subtle. I also have been overused compressors. You know, when, when you began to have computer power, so you can use a lot of plugins. Yes. At least me, I had a year or two where I had too much plugins on everything <laughs> because I could. Yeah. And uh, I don't think those mixing mixes, th they were a lot worse when I had less computer power, probably. <laughs> it is because it's like um, that old expression when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> yeah. I got it all. I got all these plugins. Let's put them on. Let's see what happens. And exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I spent a lot of time just doing things like that and not actually making music and, and ruining the music I was making. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I started out with an um, analog tape, uh, a Tascam tape, 16 channel, uh, well, reel to reel tape. We had a Mackie mixer, 32 channel. And I think we recorded bands, mostly jazz bands. And those mixes were, I think, I haven't listened to it in many years now, probably much better than <laughs> the digital mixes. And I don't think it's because of the tape machine. That one sounded really good. But I think it was because 
we didn't have so much gear. We had an EQ, a couple of compressors, a decent reverb, and uh, not so much more. Mm-hmm. And then we we work with levels instead of. Right, right. Yeah, that's um, that's funny because you are forced into what we would say now is restraint, because yeah. you know you can't run every track through the one compressor. Now you can take as many instances as you want. Yeah, exactly. So you have to really make the decisions. Like that. And I think um, I, I used to do that too. I had um, kind of the big moment with the biggest board I ever had was like, I think it was a 32 channel Tascam. Oh. And um, I had uh, the old eight app machines with the VHS tapes. And Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> those are fun, right? <laughs> and, Every mix was a performance. It was, I had notebooks filled out. Yeah. yeah. Okay, 30 seconds in, I got to turn this down to DB. And, you know, and it was just every single time you do it and you get to like three minutes in the song and make a mistake and you're like, nah. <laughs> yeah, you have to do it over. Yeah, it forced you to, to, to like make the important decisions and, you know, forget about all that extra little thing you could do here or there all the time because you couldn't, you couldn't. Yeah, exactly. Didn't have enough arms. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, that were the times, in a way. In a way, yeah. I mean, during those times, I was wishing I had infinite arms or automation yeah. or computer. You know, I didn't know it was a computer, but I wished I had more of this and more of that. And now that I have it, I feel like it, it gets in the way more than anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But in the same time, the music produced now, I think, sounds a lot, sounds so good. I'm, you know, finding new music on Spotify and you mm-hmm. listen to it. What a, that mix sounds perfect yeah. as such. Uh, I can't come up with something I heard recently now, but, you know, I, I, how many albums? This mix, oceans, everything is... And I, I like that as well, actually. I'm, yeah, well, gone are cool. the days of um, bands recording on like the cheap little four track recorders onto cassette tapes and then bouncing tracks, and every single mm-hmm. time it gets degraded. Mm-hmm. And you make your mixtape and it's degraded from the original each time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now, yeah, I mean, um, I've had my nephews, are, uh, they're like uh, 12 uh, and 8. And they can fool around with an app on their phone. Yeah. And it sounds really good. Like the quality is there. Yeah. Just just because there's all those other things are out of the way. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Point. <laughs> so I, I'd like to ask you, um, how do you come up with ideas for uh new new effects or new instruments? Um, because obviously there's a million things out there. Um, what inspires you to come up with your ideas? It's, it's a bit different. Sometimes I just want to check out some, you know, some DSP code thing that I that seem interesting, and then I start to play around with it. Maybe I make a prototype plugin of something hmm. and then i say what if i combine that with that and do that what happens then and then it more or less, sometimes it evolves to something that i present for my colleagues well what do you think about this can we do something about this and then they have ideas yeah but uh, if we change that and put that in instead and do that, maybe we could do that, this. And then we throw stuff back and forth. And at the end, sometimes, most times actually, there, oh, we have, we have something. Let's do a product out of it. Product out of it. Out of it. <laughs> That's how it happens sometimes. And sometimes we decide we need to make a good compressor, which ended up in, uh, that was on the list. We have to have a compressor, right. which ended up in the Corv Pressor, actually. 
And uh, a year ago, we talked about we don't have any EQ. Mm. So we built a pretty recent release, Goto EQ. Yeah, great name. <laughs> <laughs> it's my go-to yeah. EQ. <laughs> Yeah, that was what we hoped for. <laughs> and then we, in that one, we threw in the dynamic uh, parametric filters because that we we that was a bit how we wanted an EQ to work. Mm -hmm. We want to have a bass that sounded good, treble that sounded good. Then we use the parallel full textile idea. That's it's it's a um, Pretty simple trick by um, just process uh, uh, two filters in parallel, one for attenuation and one for uh, boosting, mm -hmm. and then uh, the two two um, parametric EQs that also is dynamic, which means you can uh, attenuate them as if they were compressed by a compressor. Right. So. Um, maybe I, I want to ask you a little bit about um, how that works um, with the dynamic stuff. So this is reacting to the audio? Uh, what do you mean how uh, the parametric EQs work? Uh, mm. Well, it's, it's a perfectly normal parametric EQ like in any stock EQ plugin. But the gain level, you said, you know, when the gain, when that frequency area has well instead of how should i put this in english uh, instead of um, then you put a compressor on it that has a side chain signal that is just that band that frequency well a pretty narrow band with that frequency and uh, what you compress are not the audio levels the complete audio level but the gain level is affected by how much it should be compressed mm -hmm. Does that make any sense for you? I think so. So basically it's listening to that particular band. And when it, I guess, yeah. the whichever threshold, um, it's going to turn down that band. Yeah, it's going to attenuate the gain uh, level of that EQ, you know, that parametric EQ. So if the signal is too loud, the gain level goes down. But this is for very short periods. It's, you know, a snare attack. Yeah. When you get above the threshold level, the gain will, the, it will push down that frequency mm -hmm. on that okay. parametric filter. Right. Okay. So now I can see that being extremely useful. Um, and you said you're a bass player. And I have this problem with my bass often where there are certain notes that are just loud on it. Yeah, yeah. They, they, especially you get a little higher on the fretboard and then the thing is like really humming out some volume. Mm. But when you just put an EQ on there, uh, I guess a static EQ, a normal EQ, uh, it, it affects every other note that happens. Exactly, yeah. Then you can, you can solve that issue with a dynamic EQ. Yeah. Okay. And also, uh, you know, if you have an um, overhead, a pair of overhead mics or something, and you have a lot of ring in the snare drum uh -huh. or a tone, you can, you can remove that tone with EQ by dynamic attenuation. It means that when you're not playing on that snare drum, you will have that frequency sounding. Right. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So... I like that because um, I've done that with automation in the past. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> and, um, or yeah, it's, or sometimes just plain old uh, <laughs> drawing it in, you know. Yeah, 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 I, know. yeah I know. And that's um, that's not the stuff that inspires me to make music. <laughs> Those no, <things>. no, 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 no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> much much more fun to to throw something on that. It's like, okay, I know what you're saying. I'll get rid of that one bass note for you. It's a little loud. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Would you say that, um, I mean, for me, like uh, when I see the products that Clev Grand is putting out, I'm thinking like a lot of it might be informed by the design. Um, Sorry, informed? Uh, like um, inspired by the design. Like, uh, 
for instance, like the multiband compressor, um, it, it feels to me almost like, and I could probably say this about a lot of them really, but um, it feels almost like you guys thought of a cool way to present it, like, like core press, corv pressor. Yeah. Um, like where the, you had like this beautiful way to represent this idea that maybe we've all used before, but now we're going to get a different look on it, a different way of thinking about it. Yeah. At least you mean, uh, we are putting design first That's as the most important. Sometimes. We start with the designs. Yeah. Is that true? Would you say? Yeah, no, yes and no, yes, maybe. Yeah, on some plugins we might, yeah, the compressor started, but we had, uh, it was both ways. We had, uh, uh, we needed to make some, a compressor algorithm at least, because we had a lot of different ideas that's where we needed the compressor algorithm. And, uh, but that was a sidetrack actually. But then Sebastian began to talk about what if we pinch audio to me, then. So yeah, Corpressor is basic, the product Corpressor is um, started from that design idea. Mm. That's true. And also, I know we have a free, uh, f you know, flanging phaser like apps called Sweep. Yes. Yeah, which which is has a very strange UI actually, that visualizes how the audio is delayed, the different audio, and how much and such. And that was basically a design idea that yeah. went into being. Um, well, the that, first was design. <laughs> yeah, that one's fun for me because I don't know what I'm doing when I play with it. I'm changing the shapes and I'm getting these like kind of star things happening or I can smooth it out. Yeah. <laughs> you listen with your ears and not look at the numbers on the screen. Yeah, I don't think there are any numbers on that one. <laughs> no, no, there's not a lot. I mean, you can link things and unlink them and then you start just moving things around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I really, I, I love that um, way of making music because, um, you know, as much as like my technical understanding, I, I value it and you need it. You need to know um, music theory. You need to understand what parameters on a synthesizer or compressor are doing. Sometimes the technical aspect sort of takes the magic out of it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I find myself listening to music and be like, that's the one, four, five progression. <laughs> that's you know, the most basic thing. When I listen like that, I don't enjoy it. But when I just feel it, it you know, it doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. But sometimes I don't, I haven't thought of it so much, but in some circumstances, you want to have numbers and, uh, you know, the precision of stuff where you can set, I want that one to be minus four dBs here. I want to see that. I want to know that it is. But I really don't know when. Maybe when I'm into, I'm doing stuff that is tricky to hear, you know, must, mastering stuff and such then I like numbers sometimes, but I don't know if it's that it's just an idea in my head or if it's, I have any use of it because I, I also, it's all about the ears, what you hear and what you like and what you don't like in the end. So. Well, I think that something like magic. It's, we don't know what it is. I'm sorry. I, I think we have uh, mysteries. Uh, <laughs> What did you say? Oh, I well, uh, to your point, um, I think something like mastering, that now we're getting into the more technical part of the process. So, yeah, you want to know exactly what's going on. But I guess for, where I'm, I'm mentioning that kind of mystery and just fun, yeah. that's more creative time where I'm, I'm trying to just have fun and experiment and see what happens. Yeah then sometimes that technical knowledge gets in the way. But yeah, as you said, when you move on to something else, the mixing, the mastering, the making mm. you want 
uh, something a little more uh, clear and mathematical maybe or numbers or whatever it is. Yeah, maybe it depends on if you know where you're going with your music in uh, then you want to, uh, what to say um, the clear stuff but if you are creating something new you don't know what where it will go you're being artistic in some way then the, these more you know sweep apps when you don't see any numbers you just have to play around and listen until it sounds good yeah then they are really making a i don't know how to say it they're good good to be used yeah that's that's kind of where they shine i guess where they come in yeah exactly best. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's kind of a nice thing for me to put together in my own head because uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I have been sort of wrestling with this. Like uh, I had, a, a, I think, a slightly more adventurous spirit when I didn't quite understand what all the knobs on my synthesizers were doing. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. I would do things that maybe I n now know you're not supposed to do. These rules and makeup and... Um, but it's nice to be able to take it like that and say, oh, well, there's a reason why that's good here and there's a reason why the other thing is good here. Yeah, exactly. And it's, I love both ways here, yeah. actually. But when I, I'm not writing very much music now, you know, producing music from scratch. But I did uh, uh, five to ten years ago. I was the only thing I did was writing music, actually. Mm -hmm. And then I think s something changes when you write music. Uh, the only th the only reason I write music now is when someone wants some kind of music from me. They order music that is. It should sound like this and like this, and it should work with this target group a little bit like that. And then I'm not creative, actually. I just do something. I'm a, in Swedish, it's called handwerkare, a carpenter or uh -huh. a craftsmanship. Right. It's 90% craftsmanship. When you make music for yourself or you just make music you love, it's something else, actually. You then you're being artistic in a completely other way, I think. Yeah, I've had that experience sometimes when someone just tells you what they need, you can do it easily. <laughs> it's just oh, you need, okay, yeah, I know how to do that. But when I go into my space to do work, a lot of times I'm like, where's it gonna go? You know, let's oh, the um... artistic breeze. And <laughs> while I love it, it doesn't always end up anywhere <laughs> no no <laughs> it doesn't too often but what it does you love it it's yeah. the best feeling in the world it is yeah that's true it's a constant pursuit um it's, exactly it's a funny thing it's a balance of like discipline and and freedom and i think and, uh, it's part of what makes it exciting for me still after all this time hmm. that it's not just okay I, I show up i do this 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 and i get a song i get this and you know i always feel lucky you know i feel like i accomplished yeah something. not just, yeah. I just showed up <laughs> you can call it luck but uh it's if you do it a lot then you have luck sometimes you know yeah that, right <laughs> that's how it works i think but it's it's some... luck is uh where uh preparation and something else meet yeah yeah i know i know discipline and preparation i forget opportunity and discipline there's something it's not just uh <laughs> magic all the time um you guys do a lot of um your work i think a good portion of it anyway uh winds up on the desktop version but also on ios versions yeah how from the beginning different yeah how does that uh yeah okay i'll let you just tell me <laughs> well uh in the beginning we we started our first product seller plugins were ios and free versions of the 
desktop. Mm. And but later on, we realized there is a quite big market on desktop as well, and we needed to make some more money out of it. So we started to charge for the desktop plugins we released. But uh, we stuff with it's fun developed for iOS actually, and. Uh, we try to keep it, uh, keep both platforms, you know, all platforms, desktop, iOS. Yeah. Well, it's nice because if you get used to working on either platform, you can then go right over to the other one and continue working the way you know how to work. Yeah. I think uh, the, the iOS uh, community is, it's not as, uh, what do you say, it's so young, it's so young, uh, the people are young and, uh, and it's, it's still growing. It has been growing for many years now, but a couple of years ago, Apple released the AUV3 plugin format. That's, that's the only thing we support in our apps oh, yeah. right now. And that makes everything a lot more stable because before that it was a few different protocols where you couldn't use multiple instances of one plugin and a lot of limitations. And it was really tricky to implement because of weird bugs in yeah, that. both in both in Apple on the Apple side and also on the host because it was hard to implement, I think and hard to implement for the effects as well, which meant crashy effects. And that gave iOS music producers, uh, well, well, it gave iOS a better reputation among music produ pro producers, I think. Probably but it, good for the tech yeah. support department too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what? Probably not so good for the tech support department too. No, no, exactly. <laughs> But it's getting more and more stable, and uh, there are a few really good DAWs, DOS, and uh, there are more and more plugins and effects coming all the time. There are new ones released every day, I think. Oh, yeah. You can't keep up. It's, uh... <laughs> no, it's impossible. Yeah, but um, I, I like that um, there is something happening where we're we're coming to some agreement of how this is going to be as opposed to, as you said in the past where it was, yeah, there was like, there's this format, there's that format. There's, this is the way you hook up this one. If you want to use it, yeah. if you want to use this one, exactly the whole other route. And yeah, for me, uh, that was a little frustrating where I, I wasn't as excited to use my apps. Um, no, no, Exactly. But I from, really like the solution um, that Studio, I, I, I think it's just Studio Mux, it's called, M-U-X, Studio Mux. It, it, yeah, 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 yeah. It allows you to use the apps like plugins on your computer. Exactly, yeah. And, that's uh, really cool. Yeah, that's fun. And it's a simple setup. You plug it right into your computer and then it somehow knows what's going on and you open the plugin just like any other plugin. Exactly. It, it routes the audio between the iPad back and forth. Yeah, the MIDI also. Yeah, exactly. MIDI and audio. And uh, as a plugin in any door, I think, yeah. on desktop. Yeah, I think with that and then, uh, you know, Link, Ableton Link. Yeah. Um, just a couple little improvements like that were major changes for me and now it's like okay yeah maybe i will hook up my ipad now <laughs> plug it into my laptop it makes sense now yeah it yeah. really does do you have to do a lot of um like different work to create the ports for both the like ios world and then the daw world no not really anymore Bef earlier on we had to uh, when we, you know, the other form, uh, standards, formats, or protocols, you were actually had to build the UI 
one implementation for iOS and one for desktop. Mm -hmm. But now we're using the use uh, framework. Okay. It's a plugin development framework that also support iOS uh, AUV3, which means we can uh, just export, uh, build for iOS, which means the AUV3 uh, we don't do almost changes. Hmm. Just adapt it for screen size and such. That's gotta so, be nice, right? <laughs> yeah, but then there, there's always a few things that comes up in every every product that you have to right. support for. You make changes for the iOS version or... Yeah, fun surprises, right? Exactly. Yeah, well, you know, you can't alt-click <laughs> on the iPad, for right. example, yeah. and, and such. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. I have a question for you, something I've wondered about a long time that you might be able to help me out with. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've run a, on Mac, um, and there's always the audio unit version and the VST version. Yeah. Is there any benefit to one over the other? Do you think one works? Benefit, pros, cons? Um, <laughs> Uh, since we are using use, we don't see that uh, from our day-to-day -day work because use just builds uh, one AU and one VST. But there are differences. One, I think, at least for VST2, is that it's always processing something. Okay. If you... Uh, audio units don't have to process it all the time. If you are putting it on a track that is silent, you have no audio on it for in the verse or the first part of the song, it won't consume any CPU, right. which a VST would do. Mm -hmm. And there is a slight chance I'm wrong now because I'm not super informed. I, I, re, I haven't dug in into the VST format since we are using use, so we don't have to. But um, but if you are talking about sound quality and such, there is no difference. Uh -huh. Okay. It's yeah, because, you know, I, I basically, when I install a new plugin, I, I get the VST and the AU. And yeah. <laughs> I, and when I go to put them in my tracks, I'm like, which one should I go into? And usually it's a matter of which one can I find easier? <laughs> if, uh, yeah. If the audio units get organized by developer's name. So there's a nice Clevgren folder. Yeah. Yet when I go into VSTs, it's by plugin name. Okay. So, I, I, th I think that depends a bit on the host as well. Yeah. That might be an Ableton Live thing, which is what I use. Ah, okay. Yeah. Um, so if I can think of a plugin name, I'll go through the VST. But if I can think of the developer, <laughs> I go okay. through the plugin. Yeah. <laughs> That's good to know because that's definitely consideration if you've got something sitting on a track that's not doing anything, but it's still taxing your CPU. I mean, yeah, like in like some hosts, at least. I know it, that happens in Reaper, and where in Reaper you can use AU or VST, you can choose for yourself. Hmm. But I'm not 100% sure that goes for all GA uh, or DOS, but I think you have to there is always processing going on. Right. Hmm. Well, that's good to know. Thanks for, thanks for tackling that one for me because I've, I've been wondering that for years. <laughs> but I, I would say if you're on Mac, use AU if possible because you can share presets between any host and such. That could be issues with VSDs, I think. Oh, okay. Hmm. That's another good reason. Yeah, <laughs> convinced me. But on the other hand, if you're using uh, Cubase on Mac and PC, <laughs> yeah, you well, should use VST. <laughs> Steinberg is they developed VST. If I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that would make sense. Keep it all in the family. <laughs> nah, exactly. Um, you guys are doing. I don't know if this is like a new thing, a new way you're going, but um, I've noticed this um, on DAW cassette and DAW LP, which are 
basically there's a tape deck emulation and then there's a vinyl record yeah. emulation, which are both awesome, by the way. Um, you've started it out. You introduced it with the web app version. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually a pretty good story. Um, this began with, I was starting to um, trying to emulate, uh, you know, vintage gear and finding out some way of doing that. That's not not the same way everyone else does. Mm -hmm. So I started to, you know, try different stuff out. I used a neighbor's cassette tape for reference. I recorded stuff into it, analyzed it in different ways and checked out how can I achieve this digitally. And it ended up with uh, something that sounded really near the tape original. So uh, I threw it to a colleague um, that is working on our web mostly, Marcus is his name. Um, and he loves cassette tapes. It's his passion of life, cassette tapes and old stuff. So he said, oh, I just have to make a web version out of this. Can we do that? Please, please. I do. A, I make the UI. Uh -huh. I, and if, if there is a way to compile C code, the language I'm using to, for the web, which I was a little bit interested in investigating, investigate how it works. So, well, oh, yeah, that's sure. Let's do it. So we made, that was a web cassette. Mm -hmm. So we, then we, oh, well, let's share it for fun. You know, for some, getting some, uh, what do you say? Uh, uh, publicity or? Yeah, yeah, some kind of publicity, yeah. you know. Uh, and we got some, I don't know how really, but it got an almost viral. It was shared everywhere. We had a lot more page views on that page than our homepage, our ClearGrand site. And it was shared over Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. So we said, we just have to make a plugin out of this. Uh -huh. And that way, well, then that was easy because we had the UI, we used the same assets and the code, the DSP code, we so put it together and made a plugin out of it. Hmm. That almost was never meant to be. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Not at all. And then we, well, oh, well, let's do an LP as well, because we had done a, how the DSP emulated stuff was pretty much there. I just have to do the same thing with the vinyl, mm -hmm. measure some stuff. So we did a web LP. P as well, and added some, you know, quirky stuff like adding uh, cable quality <laughs> and such. That is uh, a little bit of a joke, actually. Is it? <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, does that knob not do anything? <laughs> yeah, it does. It, it sounds like a broken cable. Yeah. But, uh, there's always that debate. Should I buy these expensive gold-plated cables? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really, I think it's more like an on or off thing, mostly with cables. Uh, it's not an exciting purchase, you know? Uh, no, you, no. You buy no. a new instrument and it's a new sound, it's a new toy. A cable is just, it's hard to get behind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, I know you can buy... Um, the cable you connect to your uh, high power jacket, what is it called, the, the socket in your wall. Mm -hmm. That cable, you can buy a really expensive cable. That is, I don't know what it, it's made of. Right. But then you put it in a wall and there's those thin copper cables in your wall to the transformator in the house somewhere. Right, you know? right. Yeah, so what's it's, the point at that? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's a, it was a cool way. I mean, I remember when that came out and I started playing with it and then you guys said you're releasing the plugin. I was like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a, a success, actually. And we didn't think it would be, actually. We just did it for fun. Hmm. 
that's that's really neat i i personally liked the way that you can it allowed you to just see what you were playing with um i know like you have demos too and you can download demos but there's like um it's a little bit of a commitment <laughs> it's small it's silly but yeah know, to download a demo yeah yeah and you know you try to keep your folders organized and then yeah exactly yeah that insert silence after 30 seconds or whatever they do so, yeah yeah um but the web the web app was like a really easy way to just say oh awesome i like it yeah we have actually discussing doing more stuff like that hmm. you know just for uh, for getting it out as much as possible, uh, products out as, pos as much as possible. But uh, then I don't, how fun would it be to run an EQ on the web? <laughs> you know, it, uh, who is interested in that? No. I, I, we, we talked about that a bit and that, nah, let's keep doing demo, uh, you know, demoing, uh, doing the demo stuff on those. But Right. Well, I think um, isn't Chrome supporting MIDI now? Google Chrome. Yeah, yeah, it is. So, um, yeah, it's kind of an interesting development. I never would have thought a website would be, you know. Uh, yeah, that's true. Audio like that. It's kind of cool, but um, yeah, I wonder what. I think uh, Propeller Heads did something like that actually. Recently. Yeah, it's kind of familiar. Um, uh, I'm not sure. It was something uh, they uh, had a few, some, uh, one of their synths or something. You can try it out via MIDI keyboard on, in Chrome. Yeah, I remember that coming up, something about that. Yeah. Which is, um, yeah, just, I guess, another way to get your stuff out there. And mm. It could, who knows, you know, maybe we're just in the beginning of that world, but uh, maybe down the road. Yeah, it's going to be, I think it's uh, the web is much more is going to happen on the web in a couple of years, probably. Exciting times, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. it is actually. So I have to ask you kind of the question that you probably will tell me that you can't talk about. Yeah, yet. transition. <laughs> What's that? Uh, sorry. I said, I oh, I, it's, it started to lag a bit here. You have oh, to say. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, I said, I have to ask you the question that you'll probably tell me that you can't talk about. Okay. <laughs> but uh, are there anything, uh, anything exciting in the future? Uh, anything we can look out for? Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, we have, uh, I have to think now, we have a lot, of, lot in the pipe, actually. We are finishing up one effect uh, that's going to be, I like it a lot. I can't say what it is. I'm sorry. I, I can't I, do that. I, I, I My, we have a CEO. <laughs> he, he would call me up yeah. and kill me if I said I that. don't want to get you in trouble. I had to <laughs> ask, though. <laughs> uh, well, the uh, new one, Degrader, is really cool. But the, um, oh, we're getting a, a loss again. Yeah, it's, it's it's probably my internet that's slow. Maybe the kids are watching something on something. <laughs> but now it works. Cool. I'll cut that out. We'll fix it up. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about Degrader, or yeah, yeah, Degrader uh, is a really nice app. It's uh, <laughs> I noticed a fun thing about it. <laughs> this must be like a, a joke or something. Aha, uh -huh, um, yeah. Screen breaks after a while. <laughs> Shh, don't say that to anyone. <laughs> yeah, we have an Easter egg in it. Yeah. Yeah, it's fun. It's uh, again, it's like your the work you guys do has a lot of personality, and um, I think that's a really nice thing. And I like how um everything has kind of its own look, its own design, and it's inviting. It makes you want to play with it. Yeah, we really worked on the Degrader UX. You know, it's mostly knobs and a view meter and some visualization of the bit crushing depth, bit depth. But I, I don't know how many mock-ups we threw between me and the guy who designed it. 
I think there was 30 <laughs> images of the layout and how stuff should be positioned and uh, such until uh, we both were satisfied. We really worked on that one. Hmm. Yeah, it looks great and it sounds excellent. There's quite a lot of variety you can get out of it. I mean, um, you can mangle things so it's almost unrecognizable. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's also like a nice warmth to it. Um, if you need a little hiss maybe or just the slight grit. Mm. Um, I think it's um, really useful. And oh, thanks. A lot of rain. Yeah, uh, yeah. It, you can be gentle and you can go to the real extreme on it as well. You know, make it sound like an old telephone wire modem. Yeah. Or something. Which I th also think it's fun. And it's fun to automate the parameters because... They are pretty, they are, oh, well, you can automate sample rate and you get a real cool drop-like thing out of it. The, the sweeps are pretty unique, I think, mm -hmm. about that. Yeah, for sure. There's, there's a nice way. Um, I, I love um, inside of Ableton Live, there's the redux effect. You know, yeah. It's a bit crusher. Uh, but it definitely has... It's it's very recognizable. I can pick it out. Ah, here okay, okay. You know, like the way that knob turns and the way mm -hmm. that the, the, almost like the melody of the bit crush. It's almost like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> musical, and sometimes you can almost like play it a little bit, but you can always just recognize that turning of the knob. Mm -hmm. and, um, this has a really nice character to the way it goes, and depending on where the other parameters are, it seems to change quite a bit. There's a little bit of variety in that sort of sweep. Yeah, yeah. In the degrader, you mean, or in degrader? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We I worked a lot with the the curves. How when you turn the knob from full to zero, it's not linear mm -hmm. because of you know going from. 96 kilohertz to I don't know 250 hertz. If you do that linear, you <laughs> the last two pixels will be uh, then you will hear a difference. But we, I work with the, so it will sound good when you turn the knobs actually. Mm -hmm. The curves, how the frequency will respond to the knob. Right. Okay. Yeah. And also the bit depth we've been working a lot with. Yeah, I guess when you go from 90, what you said, 96? or Yeah. From 96 to like probably all the way down to like 24 doesn't do a whole No, lot. no. You can almost, not, you can't hear it. Right. If it's, no, if you're not uh, have really good ears. Uh -huh. That's cool. That's, that's an interesting thing to have to think about. Interesting thing to have to think about. Hmm. Well, listen, I think we're getting near the end of our time here. Um, yeah. And you've been generous. And uh, again, we're dealing with a time separation here. So I know it's, it's probably getting late for you. Um, don't want to keep you up all night. <laughs> you've been hard at work. <laughs> um, but I really do appreciate you taking the time to talk to us and me, I, I mean, me, I guess, and everyone listening. And um, it's, it's been fun because um, for me, I'm a fan, so I really like the work, and I, I like the philosophy behind it, especially this this look of everything, and it's very usable. Um, all of your devices are fun in that they're they're very immediate to use, but they're also there's another level too. There's a subtlety to it, which is I think a hard thing to balance. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank thanks for having me. And uh, oh, yeah. my pleasure. And I'm sorry for my not very good English, but I... <laughs> no, no, I thought it was great. I, no problem at all on that. <laughs> I'm sorry but for bad pronunciation of all your products. <laughs> was, oh, that, that's, <laughs> that's almost um, intended. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it should be right. impossible to pronounce some of them. We have uh, actually some... Uh, we have. Some people say that you can't name them like that. You know, there is one called Bärvåg, Bärvåg, a synth, F, F, FM synthesizer. Yeah, I wouldn't even know how to 
to say that one for yeah. you. The FM. No. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, you can't you can't call it you can't call it that. Uh-huh. Anyone that's not Swedish says that because it's impossible to remember. It's, it's impossible to say. So it was probably a stupid idea. <laughs> well, I think it's kind of neat that um, it, it sort of gives. It's like you know you could name your child child one child two child three right yeah <laughs> give them a name they they have a personality so by calling you know um like the ds or is espresso it's just fun it's it's got a personality right off the bat and i think um that's something that really comes through in the design and even in the sound so if you're asking yeah. me i'm no marketer or anything but <laughs> i think it's nice it's it's you know, we don't see a lot of that in the plug-in world anyway no, no. Oh. Well, thanks. <laughs> yeah. No, well, thank you. And thanks a lot for your time. Um, should I direct anyone to any place uh, in particular? Obviously, there's clevgrind.se. Yeah, slash products. Slash products. Actually, because we are also a production company that makes film and music mm-hmm. and stuff, but that's not probably not that interesting for the viewers or listeners. Well, I I did look at some of those videos and I, I was, they were good. They were nicely put together and uh, exciting to watch. Um, so it, it didn't surprise me that you guys have like um, uh, a talent in that area too, just because you know of what I've seen of the plugin work. No, that's what we started out from that so, yeah. actually, and then I started to make. I I made a plugin. <laughs> I was hooked. I won't do any more commercials, I said. And I, I only make, made plugins after that. So. Isn't that funny how the uh, road of life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> well, That's... you want, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Brian. And it was a pleasure and fun. Thanks. And thank you to everyone that's listening. Really appreciate you tuning in. Definitely check out Clevgrand. Uh, that's K L E V G R A N D. Dot se lots of great plugins um, you've probably heard me talk about them already and if you've listened to the podcast you've heard bruce free did i say that right <laughs> bruce yeah free. yeah cool awesome working on my swedish sounds <laughs> but if you've listened to the podcast you've heard bruce free um take out some of the funny noises that happen while we're having these conversations so um it's getting used and you're hearing it in action <laughs> So again, thank you very much and thank you, Yuan, and have a great day, everybody.